floor is yours, sir. All right, so uh, welcome everyone. Bienvenue, Vid Komen. Velkommen, not that there are any Swedes here, but I wanted to at least show off my little bit of Swedish. Uh, so my name's JB Rainsberger. As uh, Pierre asked uh, when we started, uh, if you want to call me JB, if you want to call me Joe, I'm happy with both. Some people know me just as JB, so it's uh, perfectly fine. And uh, so I'm joining here from uh, Atlantic Canada. We are, uh, where I live, it's, uh, we're a little bit closer to Reykjavik, uh, than we are to uh, Vancouver. Uh, so that gives you an idea how far east. So it's actually quite lovely that with the combination of being one hour in time zone east of New York and North America has moved to daylight saving time, it's like I'm two hours closer to all of you than somebody in Toronto would have been last week or will be again next week. So it uh, makes this a little bit uh, later in the afternoon for me, a little bit earlier in the evening for uh, you wonderful folks in Europe. So glad to see you. Um, I don't know how many of you know uh, about me. Uh, I, uh, I've tried to market myself in various ways over the years, uh, but now I have settled on trying to call myself, uh, I like to say that I'm an agile coach, but actually agile and actually a coach. Uh, what that really means to me is that uh, first I like to take, I like to use the word coach to mean really coaching, um, helping people reduce the interference, reduce the, um, the difficulties that they have in bringing their full uh, ability and intent and behavior to their work. Um, and when I'm doing consulting, I try to call myself a consultant. And when I do, do training, I call myself a trainer. Uh, it's really important to me that we do not use the word coach as a substitute for contractor. Um, and I also like to say that I'm actually agile. I'm an old extreme programming guy. Uh, I became interested in extreme programming uh, in 1999 and 2000 when the first wave of books uh, was first being published. I like to remind Ron Jeffries that I have read his, uh, I have read their book, uh, Extreme Programming, installed, but I've still never paid for it. Um, and that that was the first book that I read about uh, agile software development. Uh, although I started with a wonderful little book that maybe not many people know about by Alan Davis called 201 Principles of Software Development, which I think is from maybe 1994, 1995. And it's this tiny book. And uh, on every page is uh, maybe two or three paragraphs that describe one principle of modern software development from 25 years ago with a reference to a book at the end. And this was sort of my introduction to the idea that there was a variety of opinions about how we should run software development organizations about how we should build software, about how we should run companies that specialize in building software. Uh, and it was, uh, that was all where I started to learn about, um, about books like Peopleware and Mythical Man Month and the books of my youth that were the uh, sort of the books that came before all the extreme programming and modern scrum and uh, the new wave of lean that start, seemed to start somewhere around the mid to late 1990s. And so I've been, uh, I went through my period of being a zealot for maybe three or four years where I was running up and down the hallways at IBM screaming to everyone that we should use, everyone should adopt extreme programming as the one true way to run the organization. And uh, it took a few years for me to, real, to learn both that the idea in my head about agile software development was not very complete yet, and that there were at least a thousand reasons why nobody should listen to me, um, especially when one of my colleagues showed me an IBM annual report and showed me that the 2,000 people in the building where I worked were responsible for 0.4% of the profits for IBM Canada, which was a small part of IBM global profits, which was probably a very good explanation for why nobody should listen to me. 
Um, and after I got over my initial period of being the enthusiastic zealot, uh, I began to understand that, um, that perhaps taking a dogmatic approach to agile software development was not helpful and that uh, learning how to communicate ideas effectively and to play the ball where it is, as it were, um, uh, tended towards better results. And so since then, I have tried to, uh, I've tried to offer myself to the world as someone who genuinely wants to help people uh, achieve better results, whatever their starting point is, who tends to, uh, instead of trying to push frameworks and solutions at people, carries a bag of tricks with him that is roughly lean, agile, XP, Kanban-shaped. And when the group, the organization, identifies a problem, reach into my bag for a solution that looks somewhat agile-shaped and tries to apply it to the situation and see how it would help. And so that's what I've been trying to do over the last uh, 15 years. And because I started as a programmer, test-driven development was a natural place for me to start. And that is what most people know me for. Um, and so I don't really know what we're going to do here tonight. I, um, I hope that there will be a lot of questions and challenges and uh, differences of opinion. And we can share some experiences with each other about all these topics. Uh, one of the difficulties I have is that because I don't want to be in one small box, it's difficult for me to explain what I am to people in 20 words or less. And so if you don't understand what I mean by actually agile and actually a coach, it can be difficult for me to communicate what I do. And so one other way to think of it is I'm a, I like to call myself a programmer who understands how to talk to the business. A programmer who is financially literate and has some idea, had, had to teach himself and learn from others in his adulthood how to communicate with other people. But that's why the channel is completely open. Yes. So uh, and people can ask, raise up the question whenever you want, and you can also ping people. Yes. Be free. So one, uh, I suppose one question that I could have, I mean, I have some ideas uh, of things that I might talk about, but I would be much more interested in knowing, based on the little bit that you've heard so far, if anyone out there has any comments or questions that they would like to put into the inbox as things that either we could talk about now or we could uh, make time to talk about uh, in the next hour and uh, 48 minutes. So I'd like to leave a little space and see whether anyone would like to either raise a concern, a question, an objection, or an idea, a topic, any of those things. So what uh, this Wolfgang, what we are struggling with the most is actually um, uh, uh, striking this balance between what we call alignment and autonomy. When you're dealing with not just many, many teams, but different functions, right, different silos, whatnot, um, you want to obviously improve them working together. And at the same time, be humble and uh, let them, like you said, I like your uh, analogy, play the ball uh, where it is. Not just that I'm a, an, a passionate uh, soccer player, but, uh, you know, uh, I like that uh, analogy very much. Um, you know, how do you bring them into the game at the right place, at the right speed where they are? Um, if you leave it entirely to them, um, you know, then you might actually have more difficulties to actually get the, 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 the game uh, moving forward. So thoughts you might have on, you know, how to advise striking that, finding that right balance um, and, and, you know, moving towards it, that'd be interesting. Mm. No, I'd be happy to try to talk about that. I'm afraid I don't have any magic answers there, but I imagine that uh, yours is a somewhat common uh, concern. Yeah. And uh, uh, as I like to say, this is the kind of thing where the the answer isn't just a book, but I think a bookshelf or maybe 
<laughs> or maybe an entire maybe an entire bookcase like the one behind you. Right, um, right. Yep. So th I hope that uh, I'm curious to know just quickly uh, um, speak up if this is something that uh, anyone else here is uh, either concerned about or interested in. That's interesting. Okay. Well, already we can see that one of the uh, one of the skills that we need to develop as coaches is uh, the ability to shut up and uh, and be comfortable with silence for ten or fifteen seconds. So it's something that I'm going to take probably some chances to uh, to practice here uh, this evening. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, is there more? Uh, just to add on to that for the specific uh, thing that was raised, I think being a humble listener or a very, very keen listener is one of the biggest traits of a coach. Most of us do a mistake where we don't listen. We only prepare ourselves for the next answer that we want to give or next defense that we want to create against the person who is asking the question or throwing a challenge on us. Whereas, as real coaches, we should really listen to the depth of it, what they mean, and then do a mind map of what we can tell back. And then, as you rightly said, pass for some time, few seconds of silence, and then probably respond back, which will be much, much better, in my view. Yeah, so I'm just going to make a couple of, uh, of notes here. And that's actually one of the little silly tricks that I use uh, when I am working, uh, in addition to when I'm just chatting with people that, um, because I know that many people, including, uh, me, uh, struggle feeling comfortable with silence. Uh, often I find it helpful just to tell people, uh, what I'm doing while I'm doing it when I'm not talking. Uh, which sounds odd uh, on the surface, but I think is useful because uh, as I grow more comfortable with silence, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the strange things that happens is that the people around me don't feel as comfortable with silence as I do. And so if I let silence just sit for even as little as five seconds, already people can start feeling tense. And so from time to time, for example, Raj, as you mentioned, um, the power of listening, a couple of ideas came to my mind. Um, some of you might notice that I'm looking off to the side because I'm writing a, a couple of notes down here in my book, uh, reminders of things to mention, to talk about. And if I sit and start writing things down and don't say anything, that, has, uh, that tends to make some people quite nervous. They wonder what it is that I'm writing down. They wonder why I'm doing it, uh, especially like you folks who don't know me well yet, um, have varying uh, levels of trust for me so far. And so it, uh, it makes sense for me to even simply say, okay, just give me a few moments to write down a couple of ideas for things that we might talk about so that there's little question about why I'm doing what I'm doing and, and less reason for any of you to feel uncomfortable or even nervous uh, at what I might be writing down. And especially in my work as a coach, because since some people have the picture of the coach as, um, let's say, extremely amateur therapist, a picture that I'm not sure we deserve, but uh, a picture that exists just the same, uh, anyone who has spoken with a therapist uh, might have experienced talking for a couple of minutes and then watching as the therapist makes notes for 40 seconds and immediately panicking and wondering what it is exactly that the therapist is thinking and writing down. And so I, I find that the simple act 
of telling people, hey, just give me a moment to write down a few notes. Give me a moment to get a few things out of my head tends to, uh, well, it's my, I, I was going to say it tends to put people at ease, but I don't really know whether that's true. I intend to help people feel a little bit more at ease when I do that. Um, I honestly don't know how effective it is. Um, but I haven't had anybody yell at me while I sat down, while I took 40 seconds to write notes. So I, I'll, I'll at least conclude from that that I haven't angered anybody too much uh, in the course of doing it. Um, and I find that as I become more comfortable doing those, those little things, uh, then I feel less concerned about filling the silence, which makes me feel more comfortable listening um i think that uh, in addition to uh preparing oneself to uh, just waiting for the space to say the next thing that one wants to say um sometimes uh, i in the past have spoken up merely to avoid silence that made me uncomfortable and i find that uh, having little little tricks that help cope with the silence to make the silence a little more comfortable also takes the pressure off me to give in to my impulse to fill in the silence, which makes it easier for me to sit and listen. Um, and I, I would be curious. I'm so one of my, one of my traits as a practitioner um, is to collect tricks. I'm a, I'm a micro technique collector. Uh, yes, of course, I'm interested in, in higher level principles and ideas, and, and I try very hard to live the values that most lean, agile, XP, Kanban folks tend to identify with as directly as I can. Um, but I, I'm one of those believers in um, building habits through uh, small changes in behavior and allowing that to accumulate over time. And so I like to collect tricks, little techniques that um, I guess that help reinforce the habits that align with the principles and the values that I want to live by. And so I, uh, I invite everyone here to share any of those tricks that they found helpful um, with the rest of the group. Uh, I'll try to share a few myself um, and uh, to, I, so I hope everyone here will feel comfortable doing the same thing that, uh, especially when we are talking about any kind of change in behavior, little tricks that help either ingrain new habits or trick the brain while we are trying to get used to a new way of thinking or uh, reinforce uh, the behavior that we want or help us remember to move away from the behaviors that we don't want. Uh, I'm hope that uh, folks here will be willing to share some of those and I can, I can probably share some of those myself. One of the central conflicts in listening, especially for uh, change agents um, of which coach is a specific type, is the central conflict that when somebody hires us, they expect us to change something. It's in the name of the profession. And in order to change things, we have this impulse that we have to do something because apparently doing something is the only way that we, we can change things. And changing things is what we, are, we believe we're being paid to do, even when sometimes uh, that interferes with our impulse to listen. Um, and so anyone who is uh, dealing with that conflict, I think that would be a, another wonderful thing for us to chat about at some point this evening. So we have, uh, we have a topic about, uh, balancing alignment with autonomy and freedom, um, which is effectively, I guess, a sort of collectivism versus individuality, uh, kind of, uh, conflict. Uh, we have a comment about, um, the importance of listening and maybe some difficulty that we have with truly listening compared to the appearance of listening compared to waiting for our turn to speak. 
Um, is there more? Yeah, I have a, a topic um, that's been interesting to me for a long time, even before I even knew the word agile and agile methodology. I feel anyway that a lot of this is a repeat uh, of the, all the theories that uh, have become so popular and have been practiced in some way or form for 20 or 30 years at least, and not just with software guys. Um, my background is more in marketing, and I'm wondering about agile ghettos. Okay. Uh, what, we're, what, we, what we've heard a lot from clients, and this is you know, now particularly in the banking industry in Frankfurt, where we have um, you know, large-scale organizational change and um, you know, agile transformation, um, a lot of people feel basically disconnected from the folks who get to play with their you know, agile plaything. So, so what you have is that exactly the opposite of collaboration is happening, but more like corporate envy, I would say. And uh, I would love to, you know, talk about how do you bring back humanity to that process in a sense where not the methodology is put in the forefront, which makes a certain group look more elite or uh, disconnected from the rest. So how do you actually um, deal with that as a coach, um, but also... Uh, in terms of a, a, a pure um, sort of organizational t t uh, practice, how do you how how do you deal with that? Mm. So um, I call that agile ghettos. Um, so that doesn't I don't know if that term exists, but it's, it's it good. almost it almost feels to me like the opposite. Almost that uh, that the introduction of uh, it, it feels a little bit like agile agile as a way of gentrifying. Um, we're going to now introduce Agile into these neighborhoods to make them nicer yeah. uh, because we, for whatever reason, and that makes the people who live in the other neighborhoods feel like they've been left behind, like they are the ghettos. Yeah, you're right. And then we'll put, yeah, you're right. And we'll put a Chipotle over here and, uh, yeah. you know, you know, and, uh, yeah, that's it. That, that, that's exactly, <laughs> that's, if okay. you stay, I think you could stay with that metaphor for a while and it would work for a while. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yes, because I, I guess, so the first two things that come to my mind are there's the, um, so there's the envy part, right? The, the, the people who are stuck in the older neighborhoods who are envious of the agile neighborhoods maybe uh, receiving more attention, getting new things, uh, of even just seeing the general uh, feeling that uh, the new neighborhood is getting more attention and the old neighborhoods are uh, being neglected. Um, but then there's also sort of the, the, other, the, the other issue of um, does this reflect, is there something truly different about the gentrified neighborhoods that uh, where doing agile there for lack of a better way of putting it um, has real meaning is it just arbitrary is this intentional or not um, does it you know uh, or does it merely reflect a this sort of goes uh, uh this goes a little bit back to the alignment versus autonomy question i think at a different scale maybe it's the same scale um, but at uh, the scale of if we uh, if we um, trying to think of really how to phrase this, uh, if we promote autonomy at the level of groups who uh, go agile or don't, then do we risk creating these this do we risk gentrifying part of the organization and allowing other parts of the organization to uh to fall into disrepair as it were um and what does that mean for the entire organization how does that affect the way people work with each other what so you mentioned uh, corporate envy um and you also mentioned uh, working in marketing. Is there something you think about marketing in particular uh, that uh, that has some special effect on this situation? Well, I, we, I, 
again, the two people I've talked to um, have told me that basically marketing never plays a role in any development process. And marketing has basically um, has been ah. demoted um, to a certain, a certain like, you know, pretty picture maker uh, organization uh, in most companies uh, where in the old days they would actually drive growth through marketing, right? Through advertising and whatever they stood for. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a lot of people feel they have missed the boat. And then if you look at these agile transformation projects like ING Bank, for example, that has, you know, moved over to a completely agile organization since last year, uh, or ANZ Bank in Australia, uh, you know, those folks, you know, trying to be spotted like to Spotify, but then, you know, in some organizations, everyone gets integrated, but marketing doesn't. And maybe they get called in as a stakeholder in the process at some point, and then they get to give, hand over the brand manual, right? So mm -hmm. I think so that, that, you know, I'm not saying they're envious because they don't even know what's going on some, some of the time. But to me, it feels like, mm. um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a programmer by trade uh, originally, but I went into... Um, you know, the more information architecture, conceptual and brand strategic thinking. So I've always been very comfortable with intersections of, of different disciplines. But I've, I've, even today, after doing this for 20 years, I feel that a lot of people have a hard time dealing with the confusion that happens in the intersection of transformation. So whether it's, it's a brand person talking about who we are, what we stand for, what we should say, and a person who does a product to say, well, what's the reason to interact, you know, what are value propositions and how to make this engaging and useful. These people, even today, don't know how to talk to each other. And for me, Agile is a way to bring them together. Now, yes. when, you, when you have ghettos, you know, that doesn't happen, right? And, and so when you have, as you, I, lo I love the fact that you call it gentrification because I think that's exactly the right term for it. Um, so how do you deal with that? How do you bring these guys together and how do you involve them? How do you integrate uh, them in that in their different way of thinking? You know, usually marketing people are storytelling people. They like, they like, they want to change the world by telling a story and yes. you know, the product people and also the programmer guys, usually they want to change the world with a system. So you have story and system. And to me, that's not at all a contradiction to me that. No, no, story. of course not. But how, how do you frame that for them in, in an agile process, you know, that makes them both feel comfortable because the programmer is happy with like calculating burn down rates, you know, and, and doing all yep. the stuff. They love putting, you know, boxes and stuff in things and lanes and shit, you know, but you know, a marketing person might not be that kind of structured. So, you know what I mean? How do you, how do you mm -hmm. get that done? How do you break down the side, the ghetto and the silos as, as it were? to get that done. So that's kind of like where, where, where I'm coming mm -hmm. from with my topic that I always face. And, uh, and that's why I would love to get a, any, anyone's point of view. Yeah, and I, I would like to talk about this. And so I, a flood of ideas came to my mind. Um, everything from, uh, so I have been uh, listening to um, the audio book Beyond the Goal um, in the last uh, couple of weeks. So uh, for anyone who is already familiar with uh, Ellie Goldratt's book, The Goal, Beyond the Goal is an audiobook, uh, which seems to just be recordings of some, um, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, effectively meetup group talks that he did. Um, I don't know if they were like conference talks, but something of that style, whatever it was that was the popular thing to do in the late eighties, um, where he essentially talks about trying to apply ideas from uh, theory of constraints in organizations. And he talks a lot about how uh, it, it, it gives me in mind of, he spent a lot of time talking about um, how, actually happens that local optimization hurts organizations uh, and specifically about uh, that it's it be, you know the rules that small parts of the organization adopt in order to optimize locally then kind of become the the problem they become the the bottleneck in the organization improving because it's not i mean it, Encouraging people to adopt, say, theory of constraints thinking, um, whether you agree with that or not, just assume for a moment that we agree with it. Encouraging people to adopt theory of constraints thinking is the relatively easy part. The, the, it, it, that doesn't really have a strong effect until we start uh, 
um, challenging the long-standing survival rules that those parts of the organization have enacted uh, as a way of streamlining, of, of making their operations easier, right? We have to do some kind of abstraction of what we believe, think, and understand down to some relatively small set of rules that we follow on a day-to-day -day basis that guide our intuition, that guide our overall behavior. Um, you know, some people might try to call those values. Some people might try to call them guiding principles. But there's some relatively small set of rules that we tend to follow, or at least we claim to follow as a group that sort of guide most of our behavior so that when we disagree on some small decision that we need to make, those rules are in the background fueling our disagreement and ultimately are, are, are what lead to our decisions. And if we try to superficially change the way we think, but we don't challenge those longstanding rules, then that ends up essentially creating the kind of organizational resistance to longstanding change. And I think that um, programmers think about systems. Um, programmers feel entitled to focus on what they are building rather than how that affects, uh, how we're actually going to, how that actually sustains the business. That's one of those rules, one of those survival rules that programmers have adopted as a community. I'm as guilty of it as the next programmer. Um, probably since the s at least the mid eighties, um, as organizations became big and complicated enough that software development was not the thing that the smart guy did in the corner where that one person on their own could write enough software to actually meet the business's needs for software. Um, so one of the things that I've been trying to do, especially over the last 10 years or so, is to take advantage of my beginnings as a programmer to uh, leverage my credibility and to look other programmers in the eyes and say, uh, you have to look farther than the code you're writing to see the impact that you have on the organization around you. Um, enough that began with even having to teach programmers that they were responsibility for the correctness of the code they wrote. I can't, I, like it, it boggles my mind that there are still programmers out there who believe that uh, testing is somebody else's responsibility. So now you get past that idea. You introduce ideas like test-first programming, test-driven development, evolutionary design, and one of, the, one of the things that that does is helps the programmer understand that the behavior of the system falls within their area of responsibility. And then as they go beyond test-driven development towards evolutionary design, they start to understand that caring for the architecture of the system also is part of their responsibility. And then we push, then when we introduce them to things like behavior-driven development, they start to understand how to think about the behavior of their system from the point of view of a non-programmer user. And that might be the first time that they've ever thought about their system from the point of view of the non-programmer people trying to use it. And that's then the gateway towards actually starting to think about themselves uh, to remember that what they're doing is to support a business that's trying to turn a profit and that the business is not there to give them a job, but rather they are there to uh, help support the business operating. And so then whichever programmers are still listening at that point can then become interested in things like basic financial literacy and understanding how their work impacts just the raw financial part of operating as a business. And if they get past that point, then maybe we can hand them some Peter Drucker or someone else, and they'll, they are ready to receive the idea that the, you know, the company exists to create a customer. And then and only then, maybe they are ready to understand what marketing actually means and how that actually affects what they are doing and why they need to be there in the first place. And they can start to see that aligning with the aims of marketing and sales uh, is not a luxury, but actually an essential part of them being part of the business. Alexander, you raised your hand. Yeah. 
Um, I was because I, you, you, because I was getting frustrated a little bit, to be honest. Okay. Um, because I hope you weren't being serious about any of this. Because you, you can't. You, well, you can't be serious about that being the process for someone being able to be a valuable member of a team const a constellation. Because, uh, by the way, this is true for everyone else too, because marketing people live with their mindset too and don't know anything about what programmers do. So I guess the arrogance, you know, uh, that anyone has with where they come from, that is, I think that's the problem. And what I'm asking you as a coach is how do you get these people to like start listening to each other, right? Because if you take them through this very sort of theoretical process of going through uh, the steps of understanding the things so they can talk to someone else, I mean, I think we'll, it'll take forever. Plus, you can't really, really expect, I think, someone like a programmer to become that literal, uh, literate in all of those things you just mentioned in order just to have a conversation on how to do a project together. <coughs> I think that, so that, you, you, don't, you don't see it because what you were saying is basically retraining them just to be able to talk to someone who should be in, in the project team. You know, so that, 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 so that, that's why I wanted to kind of question, uh, ask you that, or um, is that you think the process you need to go through? Because again, everyone else would have to do the same. Marketing would have to go off to come off the high horse of the brand, and they would have to understand that there's actually a value proposition you're building, and there's certain tools and techniques that you need to apply to make this happen, right? Uh, and you know, and, and there's probably other stakeholders in the mix. You know uh, that that you need to talk to as well, like lawyers and who, who have you, and everyone comes from their sort of subject matter expertise and a, and a certain arrogance of thinking that you know without them, you know, they're you know this cannot obviously progress. When it really it's the team that gets it, uh, you know, um, kind of um, makes it happen. So, and this is where my question is centered around. I don't think it's just the programmers that have to do the job, it's everyone that has to do it, but we have to do it in a realistic way where the coach plays a role, I think, of being helping them with that process. So would you say that's true? Um, well, I have to say I'm, I'm a little confused by uh, what just happened. Um, so... Um, that's, okay. that's okay, you know, the, the, you, know. Uh, is good. you know, let's solve it. Okay, uh, I'm not sure. I, I like I've. I'm not even sure I can track the number of assumptions you made uh, there to be able to even unpack them. Um, so I'm trying to I'm trying to think about what what question I can even ask that would help here. Um, so uh, I I I guess I can be serious. Um, uh, I suppose I could expect some programmers to learn all these things because I did and I'm not a genius. Um, and, uh, I think that I, I'm having a little trouble with your reaction, not, not the intensity of it. That's fine. But more the how can it be any other way? So it, it sounded to me as though you are arguing against the notion that we all need to do a better job of understanding that we are not the center of the organization and that we need to broaden our understanding of what other people are trying to do so that we can work more effectively together. Um, so now I see your reaction now, which confuses me further. So why do you not think that that was what I was saying? No, I, 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 I think we're, you know, on the same page in the, in the sense okay. that, you know, we, we all think that you have to open yourself to the other parts of the stakeholders that you should be working with. And right. I, I believe that the solution gets better when you include all kind of cross-functional abilities in the process and different perspectives and thinking. I mean, that, that's how it really works. It's like, you know, actually accommodate complexity through adding more stakeholders to the mix. But then what I'm saying is if you were an ad hoc coach, you know, you have to kind of like, you know, usually have to roll to kind of, you know, make sure that it doesn't become a chaos where it's just pantare, you know, like anything goes and then everyone just right. likes feedbacks and things they're really cool. Um, so so I, I think we're, we're on the same page. What I'm saying is that 
you were t- we talk you were talking about for I think about five to seven minutes about how you can take a programmer to go from his very sort of isolated island type programmer island and go to be a, a contributing member of a team. Yes. And, and I think that, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, you know, a lot of programmers couldn't do that. And then at the end of the quote, Peter Drucker, I thought that was a pretty funny way to end this, the story of the development process there. Um, but, um, I think that also it has to be a little bit more practical in a sense that it can be and scalable, especially when it comes to large organization. So you know what I mean? So if, because if, if it becomes a, almost a personal motivational thing of whether or not you will be able to be a contributing member in the team. So yes. if you, you know, you know what I mean? So the role of the, uh, um, the, 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 the coach in this is really to help that process along without expecting everyone to become like to go through this process fully motivated by themselves. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's why I was like, maybe you're acting yeah. a bit strongly. About, are you serious that so everyone has to actually, you know, do this by themselves and really open themselves up and almost go through this really, you know, vast process of, you know, making sure that they okay. open up skill set. You know what I mean? So, so yes. Sorry. So I, I, well, I apologize I, if I was confusing that, or I was being rude, um, or anything like that. Um, you know, um, you know, I'm not as polite as most Canadians. Um, I'm not. I, I was. I, I'll admit that was that was surprising, but I got over it quickly. Uh, I was more trying to understand the the the. Um, Joe, I have. To, Joe, yeah. I have to. I have. We have a cultural clash here. You, the nice Canadian, and he just behaved as every German. Oh, hey, hey, I, I, I. My mates are very rude and uh, straight to the point. I, I work with Dutch folks. It's fine, um, uh, and, and it's not just that. I, I, um, a lot of people will will say that I am uh, significantly less polite than the average Canadian, um, but I'm also practicing. I'm also trying to put my coach uh, hat on right now, so I'm trying. That's part of the reason that I'm trying to relax a little bit. Um, uh, so yes and no, the, the, to your direct question, no, I'm not expecting everyone to go on that journey and that they must go on that journey, or I'm not expecting everyone to successfully go on that journey before they can contribute in any useful way to the group and the rest of the organization. But yes. Uh, ultimately, people, uh, if for the people who don't go on that journey, for the people who don't take it from a from a personal motivation to be a more um, what are the terms I'm looking for to contribute more fully to the organization, the ones who don't do that will always come up to a limit as to they, they will they will uh, collectively be the bottleneck, maybe not the bottleneck, a bottleneck in the organization's development in realizing their strategic objectives. Um, you know, Patrick Lencioni wrote in in one of his books that um, I think it was the five dysfunctions of a team. He said that uh, teamwork remains the world's largest untapped competitive advantage. Uh, I think to a certain extent that remains true um, precisely for the reasons that you are citing that because you can't just wave coaching fairy dust on people and magically turn them into a self-organizing, uh, uh, effective, mature organization or group or team, because you can't do that. That doesn't seem to work. If it did, we would have achieved it by now. Um, that's precisely the reason why teamwork is still such a huge untapped competitive advantage and why it's such a big thing that it, if we can, where we can achieve it, where we get a critical mass of those people who are learning those things and reaching out and broadening their horizons and better understanding what it is that they can do uh, to better contribute to the organization, um, the much more effective that'll be. Anything else could create some short-term compliance, but beyond that, really where are we going to go? Eventually, the lack of alignment, um, actually not even lack of alignment, the indifference to 
what marketing is about, what sales are about, what testing is about, what the programmers are doing. That agile is that thing that those weird geeks over there do in their spare time while I'm trying to run the business. Or that marketing is that voodoo that that person over there does while I'm here busy trying to do real work. Um, eventually, those things are going to be the bottleneck. It's entirely possible that for many organizations, they'll achieve good enough results even within those constraints, right? It's entirely possible that the bar is simply so low in our ability to work harmoniously with each other that anyone who can achieve 5% of it could be in the Fortune 50. Uh, I, I, frankly, I don't know. Um, but I do, uh, but I would say, the reason that I mentioned what I mentioned was not because I think that everyone has to go through that as a prerequisite to any useful results. But more of an example of what I think is actually a very practical way of approaching things, which is not, it bothers me when people walk around saying agile is a mindset and either you get it or you don't. I mean, that's true, but useless. Yet, uh, ultimately, uh, there are some values, some fundamental philosophical points of view that agilists hold that other people don't hold, right? One of this is one of the most basic is when things go wrong uh, or the agilist wants faster feedback so that they can make fine adjustments and so that they can change things and try to converge towards a good enough solution. And the non-agilist will, uh, will feel guilty that they didn't think about it hard enough and they will go in the corner for six months and think really hard until they come up with the perfect solution and then come out and try to execute it. Now, that's gross simplification, but there's some truth to that. That's the fundamental difference between the way the Agilist tends to think and the way the non-Agilist tends to think. Um, that's the closest thing I can think of to an Agile mindset that is of any value, that has any practical value as far as like how we would behave differently. What I, if I try to push that mindset on people, I should say it differently. When I have pushed that mindset on people, uh, not only has not much changed, but they've actually dug in their heels and resisted the change actively. But being able to take a more incremental approach, slowly helping them see more of what's around them, slowly helping them see that there's more to their job than what they previously thought, that there are more ways for them to contribute to the organization than what they thought, that their little corner of the company, the team, the project isn't the center of the universe. Um, that that's where lasting change happens and not in giving people a new set of rules to follow and hoping that that leads to better behavior and not setting up play dates between disparate parts of the organization and forcing them together and hoping that they then learn how to communicate with each other. Yeah. I think with programmers, with a, with a stereotypical programmer, um, it's particular there because the stereotypical programmer does have uh, a more hyper-rational mindset. I think this is an advantage. This is an area where uh, people in other disciplines in companies, marketing, sales, um, upper management, have a, an advantage that they... Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look really stupid here, but I'm going to say it anyway. They were probably attracted to those fields in part because they had a better understanding of the social systems around them. On average. Um, they, the, uh, yes, they might get stuck in their own, in focusing on their own discipline, but it's a little bit easier to help to remind them, more effective maybe to remind them that there is a social system around them, that there are other parts of the organization around them. Programmers in particular are very bad at understanding this. And so I, I use them as an example of, you know, almost like coaxing the scared kitten out of the corner a little bit at a time to help them socialize with the rest of the organization. Um, if I focus on that from the interpersonal point of view, they tend to resist it. If I give them much more practical sounding arguments like, 
if you would take some responsibility for testing, it's going to make your life easier. Okay, now that you've done that, if you take some responsibility for better understanding what the customers are asking you to do, then it's going to make your life better. Okay, now that you've done that, if you take some more responsibility for understanding the financial impact of what you're doing, it's going to be easier for you. That that is a way of essentially appealing to their hyper-rational nature and helping them. It's as though after a few years without, without them really noticing that, that that's what's happened, they are more open to, uh, to seeing the organization as a bigger picture rather than just their small part in it. And it's entirely possible that people in other disciplines, um, that we don't have to take it as slowly and as incrementally with them, that they find it easier to, that we can be more direct in showing them, hey, you know, there's more than just the marketing aspect of this. There's more than just the sales aspect of this. There's more than just making the CFO happy by keeping cash flow in your small part of the organization healthy, that there's a bigger picture out there. Um, I have just found that with programmers in particular, um, appealing to them as social animals works less well than appealing to their hyper-rational nature. And so giving them practical results one at a time and helping them almost discover on their own that they're opening more to the social interpersonal aspect of it. Um, I don't know. Maybe I, maybe I am, uh, maybe I'm being too, Maybe I'm protecting them too much. I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm over. Um, what's the term I'm looking for? Maybe I am projecting my own experience on them too much. But that's what I've seen. I don't. I don't want to hijack any uh, any more of your time because there's I, I bet there's many other people with other topics. Um, but I just wanted to end this and thank you very much for your um, uh, explanations. I think you'd be surprised how, you know, you have the same problem on the marketing side, exactly the opposite. Mm. They're not, they're not hyper rational. They're exactly the opposite. They have an attention span of less than goldfish. Right. Um, and, and, you know, they love everything that's shiny and new and they, you know, and so you have a, you have a, the other side of the job to do there. Right. So right. That they have difficulty focusing. And so that, 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 you know, strategic thinking is difficult for them. They're always chasing the next um, Thing. It depends on what, what, what you think about strategy. Again, it's another whole topic that I don't want to get even right. into. I'm just saying um, I think the job to be done really for uh, those kinds of people working together just to accept that we need, we need each other. And, and I think what I've found is, is that, um, like you were saying, that if you give a hyper-rational argument to a program and it's ultimately benefiting a social cause in their case, right, to be more social about knowing about the social system, as you called it, there's something – where you can, you have to make a hyper rational argument sexy in a social way to marketing people or salespeople or mm. customer facing people. And I think that's, that's really where, um, you know, the, 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 you know, you have to invent new tricks really because yes. that's at the intersection of a lot of confusion and, uh, um, untreaded territories. Right. So mm -hmm. anyway, thank you very much. I don't want to. Oh, keep... oh. and, and, and actually before, before we stop, I want to ask you quickly about the, um, you know, we started here by talking about gentrification and different parts of the organization, um, some acting, I guess, in an agile way and some not, and the, 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 the negative effects of sort of the agile neighborhoods getting more attention, blah, 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 is I know we ended up going in a slightly different direction. Is there more about that specific problem uh, that you can tell me about? Because I, that I think that that combines very nicely with the first uh, question related to... Um, the conflict between alignment and autonomy. I think it's the same, it's the same general uh, topic, but I don't think we're necessarily uh, stealing time from other topics in going into detail here. So is there more that you can say about that? Um, you, have in you, mind? you mean the, the different gentries, so to speak, uh, in, of the corporate ecosystem, um, uh, not getting together, is that what you're saying? Uh, well, that's actually, that's what I'm wondering. So one of the, like one of the things that came to my mind was in extreme programming, one of the practices is the whole team that at the very small scale, one of the difficulties is that people have this picture in their mind that programming and testing and, uh, and managing the project and tracking progress are different parts of the team rather than we're in this together. And these are things that we need to do together and we need to figure out how to do them together. Uh, and so, you know, my naive reaction would just be, 
okay, so let's identify the different activities that we need to go through in order to be able to have a successful result and keep hammering at people in various ways the idea that we want to build a whole team around those activities and stop thinking of them as you do your bit over there, you do your bit over there, and you do your bit over there. Uh, do you mean like that? That kind yeah. of... I think the complexity, I think in, in that team that you just mentioned, everyone still knows, like works in the same paradigm. They all have the same mental model. They're all programmers or, you know, dealing with the technical side of a process of getting something done. Someone is doing testing, someone's doing programming, but they're all doing the same thing. When you talk about organizational change, though, you have totally different mental models that actually need to take through an agile process ultimately. Ah, so, okay. So I, I don't mean that because I'm also including project managers, first and second line managers who are now struggling with the difference between what's on the line, what's in the middle, what's at the top, okay. uh, as well as this nebulous idea of customer, which is this magic person that extreme programming thought would be the mixture of the technical solution architect and the end user and sales and marketing. Right. Um, a, a naive view that was very programmer centric, but they had to start somewhere. Right. Well, I, I think that's extremely complex again, especially mm -hmm. when you have um, stakeholders in the mix that uh, do not have that same hyper focus or uh, hyper rational mindset. And yet those are the people who usually effectuate change in the marketplace because they're not hyper rational because business is not done with people in a rational way. Mm. Maybe things are built in a rational way when you need an engineering mindset, but in order right. to sell stuff out there, you need to appeal to people's emotion and they largely make decisions, 80% of them irrationally, right? Yes. And this is just how it's done. So when you build products that work fine on a technical level, but they have no sex appeal to do a job of a salesman and it doesn't help them do sell the, 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 the product, you're going to have an issue, right? So, so mm -hmm. obviously you're not just marrying methods uh, or different ways of thinking because that's, that's the easiest way to do. It's like a lot of like product project teams do not know there is a massive amount of data available in the, in the, in the insight and marketing teams about the customer. So they don't, they start from scratch and do it themselves, even though they, you know, the company has paid a half a million in studies on this topic. And that's already hard to do, but right. once you, you know, just integrating that kind of like, oh, there's stuff there, let's use it all in the same team. But then changing the mental model of having someone who's not hyper-rational be in that process or someone hyper-rational having to talk to someone who's not, you know, I think there's an, e there's an easy way to say, oh, well, then that's not for me. And then, then that's where the whole thing starts falling apart. Right. And then as a coach, you're just ra running around like after, after children and you're trying to make them play together again. Yeah. And that, that's where my interest was coming from because that, that's where I feel a lot of like also the talk starts and the envy and, you know, all the sort of the, the confusion behind what it is we're doing and trying to achieve to get together. So, yeah, I think that is still happening. Yeah, I, I do think that's a real topic. And so there are two things that come to my mind uh, that go back to the, the you know, the, your, your sort of incredulous reaction. Um, I think that there is, so one, I mean, one part of it is the sort of theory of constraint style, focus on local optimization, um, being aware of our tendency towards local optimization being aware of the damage that that does, that that, uh, that that maybe makes things better for a smaller group of us in the short term, but actually damages the organization at a higher level. Merely making people aware of that is hard enough, and that's one of the things that I try to do. It's one of the reasons that I teach theory of constraints, even though many people now are starting to think that theory of constraints is an overly linear model and it doesn't work in complex adaptive systems, blah, 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 blah. Uh, frankly, I find that reaction, again, that's another reaction that's kind of true but useless. Uh, strictly speaking, yes, theory of constraints it, it, uh, you know, puts a, a linear model on what we now understand to be inherently complex systems. At the same time, our collective level of performance in this area is so unbelievably low that even a linear approximation of these complex social systems is enough for us to get good results. And to the people who have that rational mindset, teaching them theory of constraints, teaching them the thinking process, 
uh, making them aware of the dangers of local optimization is often the way in to getting them to think about the wider picture in a way that they wouldn't have have bothered to do before. For others, um, then, and let me just uh, go back a second because I, I was stupid enough not to write things down. Um, Ah, for others, I would tend to go more in the direction of, say, you know, the five dysfunctions of a team model and to come at it purely from a social point of view and say, well, here is a model of how people work together. And, you know, there are these five stages, roughly speaking, that we, that we have a tendency to go through, not in, in specific order, but inattention to results is at the top. It's the hardest thing to... Uh, it's the hardest thing to focus on because of this conflict between alignment and autonomy. Um, that ultimately people are not aligned on, uh, they're not aligned on results. And because they're not aligned on results, they're not really working together. And so for the people who have that more hyper-rational point of view, making them aware that they are, um, that in the best case scenario, they're making, they're, they're very efficiently doing entirely the wrong thing. And just making them aware of that danger helps a lot. And that helps with, again, to, be, to, to take, use stereotypes for a moment, that helps with the deeply technical kinds of people, the programmers, the testers, the, the maybe, um, you know, uh, uh, the scientific researchers who are involved in software development, anyone who tends to come at things from a very rational point of view, making them aware of this counterintuitive notion that they're optimizing their local part of the, of the world is not only not effective, but actually potentially harmful. That's something that they might never have confronted before. And one of the things that I love about extreme programming in particular is that it puts that idea at the center. Okay. It's, you, you have to read a couple of layers deeper than the 12 practices to see it, but it's there. And then for the other people, for the ones who are less rational, who maybe have the focus problem or who have the, 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 the EQ um, that have the emotional intelligence, but maybe are having trouble in other areas, um, to, sh to, to appeal to them more on the level of um, doing what's best for you is not always going to advance the results of the organization, that there's, that, you know, uh, uh, that there, there's more than just you involved in all this. You know, one of the things I like to say to them is there's more work here than you alone can do. So if you don't figure out how to communicate effectively with other people, uh, there's a pretty, there's a pretty hard limit to what you'll ever be able to achieve. And if that's enough for you, that's an okay strategy. But if you want to do better, I'm ready to help you. Um, those two ways of approaching it can help. And they both come from, you know, the one comes from the more, here's the theory behind uh, the mechanics of agile software development. And the other comes more from the, this is why um, software as a uh, human focused way of thinking about how to build software is important. Um, now, being able to come at it from both of those points of view makes it much easier for me to go to an individual person or a small group of people, get to know them a little bit, and start to see which kinds of arguments are more likely to nudge them in a direction towards better results. And so, to go back to the question of what, does a co what can a coach do? A coach who focuses too much on one or the other will not have as much success, will not have as much impact as a coach who can do both. And so that's why it's important to me to both have, not just to go in with sticky notes and retrospectives and, uh, and, and uh, focus on psychological safety and magically expect the team to adopt the right practices, but to also be, to be able to go in there with some very specific concrete behavior changes, small things, non-threatening things, or just enough threatening things that affect their habits, that affect the way that they actually behave on a day-to-day -day basis, 
and the changes in thinking will follow. Not everyone reacts to one or the other, or sorry, not everyone reacts to either one or the other. Being able to provide both and to get an idea for which people react better to one or the other has a tendency to, um, to lead to better results. So that really has more to do with broadening the bag of tricks more than anything else. All right. Thank you. Um, so then with the... Um, so I find that uh, the, the, I think some of the central um, difficulty comes from uh, making the programmer tester small team, small team part of the organization more aware of the fact that they are a spec on the profit and loss statement of the company. And that's why maybe not as many people care about what they're doing as they do, as well as um, helping people in, say, marketing and sales who might have a focus problem understand that uh, we can't change the central focus of the, of the project every two months and hope to actually ever get anything done. Um, while at the, I, and I actually try to tell people who have that focus problem we're actually, the programmers and testers and the, the let's call them the technical, the technical groups, just to give them a, a, a brief name. I don't like it, but it'll help. The technical groups are actually working on building better habits so that they can execute more quickly uh, at less cost and turn around your wonderful ideas uh, more quickly than they can do now. You need to use that power responsibly. That doesn't mean that you now have license to to fundamentally change the direction of the or of the uh, you know to change the direction of the organization every two months. I don't know anybody who works that way. At some point, we need to be able to blend those two things together. Um, one of the magic phrases that I use to confront people of all stripes is, "I don't know how to do that." This is one of those coaching tricks that works really well because I don't have to argue with you about mindset. I don't have to argue with you about philosophy. I don't have to convince you to adopt my way of thinking. I don't have to convince you that I'm right and you're wrong. Um, but if you ask me for something that I don't know how to do and I tell you I don't know how to do that, I don't know how to change the project on a dime every two months, I don't know how to uh, whatever you want to call it, as soon as I can look you in the eyes and say earnestly, I don't know how to do that, uh, it has this magical power because you can't argue against it. What are you going to tell me? Yes, I do. Well, no, I don't. I don't know how to. You're, you're now asking me something that's impossible. What would you like to do about it? The agilist in me would say, well, let's try to find some fast feedback cycles and see if we can take learn something from that and use that to help change our direction and move in a direction that's close to what you want, but also close to something we can actually do. Whereas, as I said, the non-agilist might say, well, I guess we have to go to our separate corners for six months and think about what we've done and come up with the perfect solution and come back. Um, I find that, that that statement, I don't know how to do what you're asking me to do, helps confront, helps everyone confront this. There's some impossible thing that they're expecting the rest of the world to do, whether it's that the, the programmers are expecting the, the company to bow to whatever their whims are, or the marketing person with less focus is expecting the technical team to be able to change what they're delivering on a, on a dime. Once we confront each other with the, the things that we are, the impossible things that we're asking for, then maybe we can start to say, okay, now, here are some principles that I work with to help us figure out what to do now that we've identified that what we're, you're asking for is impossible. Let's figure out how to do something together. Um, and that is, one of those, that is one of those slow things that uh, if there's a shortcut to bypass that, I'd love to know what it is. Because that also helps with the alignment versus autonomy conflict. There's a point at which Waiting for alignment means, waiting too long for alignment means we never actually try to do anything. And um, letting everyone do whatever the hell they want, even if they seem to have the best intentions, leads to chaos. Um, I don't know how to balance that rather than, uh, apart from, from finding any way we can to help the, each group 
understand what they are asking the other group to do that the other group doesn't know how to do. And feeling comfortable saying, I'm sorry, I don't know how to do that. Um, and learning the, you know, 140 different ways to say that so that you're not just sounding like an asshole. Um, that's slow and that's annoying and I don't know a better way. Is that not a question uh, leading to, uh, to alignment from an autonomy perspective? How do you mean that? Um, if you ask uh, someone, I don't, oh, you tell somebody you don't know what to do. I don't know how to do what you're asking. Yeah. Yeah. So this lead that maybe he comes with an idea. Right. And that's Maybe. one of the reasons to say it that way is that if you do have an idea of how I can do it, I'm open to hearing it. Then you're, then you're starting a conversation. Exactly. And a conversation uh, is in alignment. Uh, it's, but it, it is, yes, it's a way to improve alignment. One of, the, one of the things that you're doing at that point is trusting the other person by being vulnerable and saying, there is a thing I don't know how to do. I'm open to suggestion. Um, I, you know, one of the, one of the metaphors that I use is I want to try to turn a conversation from we are sitting on opposite sides of the table to we're sitting on the same side of the table opposite the problem. So there's some, there's some thing that we're trying that, that the larger we are trying to do. There's some conflict at the center of it. There's something that we need to do that we don't know how to do. Um, there are two groups of people who are pulling in opposite directions or some kind of central conflict like that and being willing to, if I trust you enough to say, I'm sorry, I don't know how to do what you're asking. The real power in that statement lies in the unspoken invitation to come up with different ideas, the unspoken, well, somewhat unspoken openness. Maybe I need to learn something from you. Maybe you need to learn something from me. Um, maybe we need to admit that there is something that we collectively need to learn uh, where the skill, is, the skill is somewhere outside of this room. We don't have it together. Um, those are all different strategies, right? If it turns out that you have the answer and I don't know it, then you can teach me the answer and now I can do what you're asking me to do. We win. If we find out that none of us has the answer but we know how to find the answer, then that just means that some, of, some group of us needs to sit down and read and learn and find out maybe we need training, maybe we need uh, very specific decision-making conversations, something. And if the expertise is nowhere in this room, if none of us knows what to do, then, then we know that we need to approach it more with the, we need to embrace the uncertainty, we need to uh, approach it more from the point of view of here's an open question where we have to do research together. Um, in each of those three cases, the strategy is different. But when all that's happening in the moment is that there are two people yelling at each other, disagreeing about what to do. Um, in that moment, it's not clear which of those three strategies we should use to figure out how to move forward. And so then we just end up being stuck. And when I say, I'm sorry, I don't know how to do that, um, I find that it helps to break that cycle. It helps to, as you say, uh, move, the, uh, move the conversation away from walling in the difficulty towards creating some kind of shared understanding or alignment about where we stand. And then figuring out, is it that one of us needs to teach the other? Is it that we need to spend time learning something that, that is a, an understood unknown? Or do we have to do research? Because if we have to do research, then we have to go back to the people who are paying the bills and tell them the bad news that we need to invest some money in some highly uncertain research and we have no idea how long it's going to take to find an answer. And maybe now we need to have the conversation about how much money is it okay for us to throw away before we decide that we can either keep going or give up. Those are very different conversations to have. And it's a good idea for us to explore which of those conversations we need to have. Yeah. Otherwise, we're just going to stand there and keep yelling at each other. It gives me the feeling that you're starting to make a negotiation. Absolutely. So one of, the, one of the simple tricks, one of the coaching tricks that I use that I, don't, I hate to use. Well, no, that's not true. Secretly, I love to use it, but I hesitate to use it because it's a bit violent. Um, 
occasionally I end up in conversations with people where we are locked in this central conflict where th they, need, they need me, I'll put myself in the point in, in the conversation. They need me to do something and I can't do it. And if I just tell them that's impossible, then they'll tell me the 37 reasons why it's possible and we just end up locked in that argument. And now let's imagine that I've tried saying I don't know how to do that and they still resist. So I've tried to have that gentler conversation with them. I don't know how to do what you're asking me. You know, I'd love to be the person who knows how to do what you're asking, but I'm not. I'm happy to help you find the person who knows how to do it. And if they should be here instead of me, then I'm willing to let that be the result. And there are still occasionally people who just don't, they resist that entirely. For whatever reason, either uh, it makes them uncomfortable, they don't, want to, they don't want to be vulnerable, they don't want to look stupid, um, Maybe they just genuinely, they're, they're a hard ass and they genuinely believe that I'm being, you know, touchy feely, you know, hippy dippy bullshit. And then I just turn to them and say, okay, I need you to speak Estonian by Thursday. Now, of course, it helps if they don't speak Estonian. I just say to them, I, without, with no warning, with no understanding of what's happening, I look them straight in the eye and say, I need you to speak Estonian by Thursday. And I just wait. This is where being comfortable with silence is really helpful. Because often it'll take them about 20 seconds to even, like, they're not sure they understood what I even said. So then I repeat it. I don't think you understand. I need you to speak Estonian by Thursday. And I'm willing to push this as far as they want. You, they're going to say, well, I don't speak Estonian. You don't, you don't seem to understand. If, I, if you don't speak Estonian by Thursday, it costs me 1.7 million euro. Maybe 1.7 million euro is not a lot of money to you, but it's a hell of a lot of money to me. So get off your ass. I need you to speak Estonian by Thursday. And depending on the situation, of course, I can escalate this as far as you want. But of course, you've guessed by now that what I'm trying to do is to get them to the point where out of sheer frustration, they say, nothing you do Nothing you say, nothing you threaten me with, no yelling, no pleading is going to make me able to speak Estonian by Thursday. That's a lovely. And then, I say, and then I say, aha. All right. Now, now that you know where I am, can we please now sit on the same side of the table and have an adult conversation about what we should do next? It's one of those like power tool, chainsaw, nuclear bomb ways of quick alignment in a desperate situation. It's not nice. And the only reason that I love it is because it's devious. But as a, as a person trying to approach things with the gentle voice of reason, I feel, I feel a little bit of personal failure whenever I have to use it. And I don't use it often. I've really only used it three or four times. Um, but it is one of those ways to really gain alignment quickly or to at least uh, bring to the surface whether the other person is objecting to you on rational grounds or on irrational grounds. Because if they're objecting to you on rational grounds or irrational grounds, the strategies for dealing with that situation are very different. And I want to learn that relatively quickly so that I can figure out whether to uh, uh, approach their objections rationally or to treat them like the scared kitten in the corner and to try to pull them out slowly but surely and to treat them with significantly more compassion and to understand that this is going to be that long, frustrating, personal journey kind of coaching relationship rather than the you know, tough love, smack them across the face, bring them to attention kind of relationship. Uh, that's one way that I can discover relatively quickly which of those strategies I need. And assuming that I haven't destroyed the relationship in the process, assuming that we can repair it, um, the results can actually be uh, surprisingly good. I have a question for you, Joe. Yeah. So how do you link this to another point in your backlog with humility? Well, so you'll notice that the... Um, uh, I call this the nuclear option for a reason. Um, so certainly I don't lead with this. There was a period in my career where I actually used to lead with this 
And I freely admit what an incredible asshole I was. Um, you know, that's, that's part of my journey, especially through my late 20s and early 30s, was in deeply understanding what a colossal asshole I was and trying to fix that. Um, and that, you know, that was a period of accelerating my development of humility, if I may be permitted to say that. Um, you know, there are, there are ways that I treated people 15 years ago that I would be embarrassed to admit today. But you can't deny its effectiveness. And there are some situations in which um, there are some situations in which it is the last thing that might possibly work. And so when I have exhausted all the uh, when I have exhausted all the other ways of making progress and assuming that I can't just walk away, assuming that I shouldn't say it that way, assuming that walk away isn't a clearly better option. Assuming that I really do want to try to make an impact here, uh, then I will strain. It seems strange to express it this way, but I am willing with great compassion in that moment to say, I am willing to be the person to help you confront this problem. Even if it means that you will hate me for the rest of your life. If I have to walk away and somebody else will come in and make progress because I have burned the bridge behind me, I'm willing to accept that. That's something, and that's, you know, it, it can be very difficult on the outside to distinguish between I'm doing it because I can and I'm doing it because I can. Uh, I don't mean that I'm willing to do it because I care so little about the results that I, that I'm going to throw a grenade into the middle of the, of the group and let it explode and whatever happens, happens. I more, I more feel it from the point of view that I am okay with failing to help you make progress on this issue. That if you like, my humility comes in recognizing that there are some problems that I am not going to be able to help you solve because of you, because of me, because of us, because of the context, I don't know. That I am willing to, uh, I am willing to recognize my limits and that uh, I am even willing to go as far as to engineer a crisis even if it means that I'm not going to be able to be part of the reconstruction, even if it means that I'm not allowed to be part of that experience, which is maybe the hardest part of being a coach, right? One of the hardest parts about being a coach is not being able to see the positive results when they finally come. That you might, if you're lucky, you get to see some, but you might have tremendously positive impact and not be able to see it because it happens five years after you leave the room. I've made peace with that. Um, but if I sense that you can handle it and I sense that the organization, some, the group, the team, whatever, can recover from it, I am willing to, I am willing to detonate the bomb even if it means that you immediately escort me out of the building. Uh, and it's hard, it's, even as I'm saying the words, it, I'm having difficulty even believing myself, but I can feel the difference. I can feel the difference between throwing the grenade in the middle of the room out of a perverse sense of fun and doing it because I've tried everything else. And this is the only thing I think that will help, right? That's one of the coaching techniques, sadly, is engineering a crisis helping accelerate the point where the pain of keeping things the way they are is greater than the pain of changing them so that people feel motivated to change. Um, I hate having to do that, but I recognize the reality that some situations call for it. And I prefer not to do it, but I'm not above doing it. So it sounds more like kindness than humility. Uh, I think it's the two together. 
because if I thought that I, if I thought that I knew everything, if I thought that I could fix every problem, then I could be much more cavalier about, uh, about using that option. I happily walk around uh, screaming at people and confronting them and, and you know, under, the, under the umbrella of radical candor or radical transparency uh, in the worst possible way with every bit of arrogance that, that you know, my 28-year-old self would have used. Um, I, I, and so I think there's, a, but recognizing that I, I might not necessarily be able to help guide people to improve the situation, maybe the, the best thing I can do is recognize my limit and the kindest thing I can do is um, help people confront the seriousness of the situation, even if I'm not then part of how they get past it. Um, I would really prefer, I, and I have, Used, I, will, I haven't used the Need You to Speak Estonian by Thursday in a long time, and I might never use it again in a real situation with a client. Um, and I, 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 I kind of consider it almost a personal failure if I have to use it again. Um, or maybe that's just a sign that I'm not putting myself in difficult enough situations. Maybe I'm not challenging myself enough. You know, it's the old, it's Kent Beck's old saying that if you never miss a flight, then you're spending too much time in airports. Maybe, maybe I am doing that in my career. I'm getting old now. Maybe I don't have the energy for that level of confrontation that I had. You're, get, you're getting old. I'm uh, kidding. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm older than you. Come on. I know. I know. I get the joke. Oh, and I, when I, now that I can say that I've been doing this for 20 years, I can start using jokes about how old I am. Yeah, the, the, the more terrific is when you have a teammate. Say, oh, you, my, my dad knows you. Oh, very well. Who are you? Say, oh, shit, I was there when your dad met your mom. <laughs> right. And then you start crying. You say, yes. I'm not that old. Sorry. No. Yeah. Um, but are you using sarca sarcasm? Pardon? Can you be sarcastic? Can I be sarcastic? Yeah, yes. instead being having this bomb like, oh, let's do this. Oh, absolutely. That's a very good idea. <laughs> I, I, frankly, I, so uh, this could be a bit of a culture clash. So I have been working at um, off and on with Spotify for the past uh, four years. And uh, I've had the experience of a couple of my friends who are also coaches who have been in the same building while I've been working there. And one of them pulled me aside and told me, you know, you seem to use sarcasm a lot in your uh, in your, in the way you communicate with people. Um, and I'm not sure that it has the results you're expecting. Now, this could just be that this one person doesn't like sarcasm as a, as an, as a, uh, um, as humor, or it could be that, uh, maybe I overestimate the, um, Swedish tolerance, the Nordic tolerance of, of, um, of sarcasm. I, I genuinely don't know. Um, but I do, um, I do tend to use sarcasm as a way of trying to uh, bring people to attention about their, um, uh, when someone is clearly conflicted, but they can't seem to see the conflict inside them, I will have a tendency to use sarcasm to try to make them aware of the conflict. Like when they say one thing, but do another, or when they, you know, when they claim to be agile, but then don't want to favor feedback or when they, you know, any of those kinds of things. And I say, yes, because as we all know, uh, the last thing that the agilist does is value feedback. So of course, it's a very good idea for this scrum team to go off in the corner and talk to themselves uh, for four weeks to decide what to do next. And then stop and wait for them to notice the, the, uh, the remark. Um, I honestly don't know whether that's effective or not, uh, or I don't know how effective that is. Um, so could I use that instead of the nuclear bomb, you know, throwing the grenade part? I think I already do that. Uh, I'm not sure how good it is. I'm still experimenting with it. I am experimenting with uh, less sarcasm and more, um, 
more trying to frame things as non-judgmental observation. Um, and I honestly don't know how much that helps, but I'm trying it and I feel better about it. And if I feel better about it, then maybe uh, I'll interfere with my own ability to coach people less. I mean, you know, to go back to the, the, the you know, the, the, uh, the comments from earlier about, you know, is, are we really going to go through this long drawn out approach to help people open themselves up to the world around them? Um, I at least need, I at least feel like it's my responsibility to go through that myself. Um, you know, to be aware of where I'm falling short and, and to try to develop myself so that I can provide better things to the people around me whom I'm trying to coach. Um, one of the reasons that I coach other people is so that I can coach myself better. But I, I coach myself better than I can coach them better. Yeah, but I, I, I love your question about I don't know. Yeah. I think this is very, very powerful. I always think about it. I don't know. It's also putting you uh, is a uh, self deconstruction about the image you have from the perspective to say, oh, this guy's GB is coming. Oh, and then you say, oh shit, I made a, I made that's I'm wrong. Sorry, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Is you're putting people on the same eye eye level, which is very yes. interesting. It's actually one of the stupid little tricks. I, again, I, I don't, uh, you know, some of these little psychological tricks feel um, cynical, but they work. So uh, I do a lot of training uh, because training is easy to buy and training is easy to sell. So, you know, uh, I do a lot of training. And of course, uh, especially programmers are very accustomed to the typical classroom context. Uh, they are all sitting in chairs, I'm standing in front of the room, I'm walking around and I'm talking, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I do a bit of that, less than I used to, but not zero of it. And when I'm teaching something as simple as programming techniques, test-driven development, something like that, I don't mind that approach. I, I you know, there are, there, you know, when you're teaching elementary mathematics, elementary arithmetic, I don't think that necessarily has to be a voyage of discovery for everybody. I think there's there, a, a little bit of teaching goes on. And as long as you're not creating an environment where people feel uncomfortable to play around with the ideas, then that can be perfectly acceptable. Not all teaching has to happen from the back of the room. However, when it comes time to discuss real topics, difficult, complicated, sensitive topics, I always make sure that I grab a chair, sit down somewhere among the people, make the circle smaller, make it smaller groups, whatever it is, sit down with a chair and make sure that we are all in the same position while we're talking to each other. And it's a stupid little psychological trick that I hope conveys to people that I don't consider myself an authority here. Yes, I know some things. Yes, there are probably some things that I know that could help you. Yes, I'm prepared to tell you those things, but I'm struggling as much to figure these things out as you are. Uh, I just maybe have 10 years, 15 years, five years head start in thinking about it compared to you. Um, and that, th that just means that I've spent more time thinking about it. It doesn't mean that I know more. It doesn't mean that I uh, have better advice necessarily. I'm as prepared to learn from you as you are prepared to learn from me. I want this to be a uh, communal experience. And I find that the simple act of sitting down and not standing up and looking, literally looking a meter down at people who are sitting in a chair, um, I think it helps them feel a little bit more like we are having a discussion together. And I know for me, it reminds me that uh, I am not the only one in the room with good ideas, that I'm not the only one in the room who has gone through these things. I'm not the only one who has had some successes. It reminds me not to believe my own shit too much, but to make room for what other people in the room have to say as well. And I think that that 
you know, it, it helps remind me to listen to them as much as to remember the good things that I want to tell them. Yes, here's the book that I read that helped me answer that question for myself. Yes, here's the, here's a story about a time that I tried this technique when it worked well. And so, you know, you might be able to use that technique in dealing with that difficult person on your team or any of those kinds of things. Um, I think it is, uh, I don't know how much they appreciate that signal, but at least it reminds me not to think too much like I'm the teacher and they're the student, but more to recognize that uh, this is an opportunity for everyone to share their experience with each other. I just might have more, ex I just literally might have more experiences to share with them than they have with me. And that's obviously not always true. So it reminds me to adopt a more humble stance in, in working with these folks. Okay, lovely. Is it another question in the audience? Yeah, so we haven't talked about alignment versus autonomy much. A little bit we've touched on it. But before we try to go there, would anyone like to put anything in the inbox? Wolfgang, are you frustrated? Audio. Um, no, not at all. This is very interesting. Uh, obviously, uh, slightly different than, uh, you know, uh, covering this topic in more depth, but uh, definitely very interested. So no, no worries, not, no frustration at all. I think the good news is that we've at least talked about a handful of things that are, uh, that are directly related to the question you raised about alignment. In, absolutely, in absolutely. Yeah, and maybe one of the things I didn't want to break yeah. the flow when you were having this discussion earlier between the development types and the marketing types. Yes. Here's one experience I'd like to share. Please. Where it actually is, um, funnily enough, where these very different types of mindsets we got somehow connected uh, on a topic when it comes to this notion of um, component versus feature team structures, right? So we okay. happen to have in the meeting room a couple of drawings, right, on whiteboards and even a post or whatnot to kind of convey that thinking that, you know, in the development teams, we ought to, you know, think about differently how we how we change this and, and become more effective, et cetera, et cetera. And it just so happens that right after that meeting, uh, in walking a few uh, of the leaders, thought leaders on the marketing team that heard all about this agile thingy and want to see, you know, what they can do about it and what they can learn and whatnot. Uh, and what is this graph there? And so we start to explain, right, how, you know, it harms us when, you know, we have a, a, a an area of uh, constraint in one a development side and we can't really move things easily about because we have so much, you know, we're, we're really uh, kind of stumbling over our own feet. And then explaining that, you know, we have certain levels of expertise that then are needed somewhere else and this and that. And before I know it, they were drawing, they were annotating that drawing with exactly what happened in the brand team, right? You have events going on, you have communications experts, you have this and that and the other. So between, you know, a here's a very technical issue that is really speaking to engineering types and there's architecture pictures right behind it and whatnot. And here you have the relationship types, the social animals, so to speak, in the marketing that are actually struggling with very, very similar, if not the same, challenges, structural mm -hmm. challenges, right? Mm -hmm. And I found that fascinating to see, you know, how one, should I say, approach, I don't even want to call it trick or one, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but approach, one way of thinking about it actually helped in a very, very different setting. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me at all. Um, and, uh, other than the first time I saw something like that happened, it's, you know, that experience that you have when somebody gives you a puzzle and you think about it for 10 minutes and it's one of those things where the answer is very obvious as soon as you hear it and you mm -hmm. feel like, wow, how did I never think about that? That's so obvious. Yep. Um, this falls into that category for me. Yep. Obviously, uh, even if we have different ways of uh, being in the world, if we have different personal strengths, um, regarding 
either how well we interact with people or uh, what kind of work we do, how we think about the work we do, there are still some the, there are still some stereotypes of how groups of people struggle to work together that are the same for all kinds of work. And just being aware that we share similar problems, similar struggles, uh, helps us in then being, you know, it, I'll bet you that the people who saw that happen immediately started to see each other as a new resource Absolutely. for advice and as someone to talk to and oh, yeah. that they gained more respect for each other merely because they showed each other that they shared a common experience. Absolutely. That's definitely what happened. Yep. So there's a clear and obvious thing to do there. Mm -hmm. If we expose each other to our experiences oh, yeah. and then recognize the similarities between them, uh, then communication and working together tends to improve. Mm -hmm. Duh. I mean, that, you know, and yet, how is it that, how is it that we still have to struggle with teaching this to people? I don't get it. Mm -hmm. I get that's beyond obvious. But then uh, last summer, I finally, after years of resisting, I finally gave in and started reading about nonviolent communication last summer. Um, part of the reason that I resisted it was that a, a couple of people online who were uh, vocal supporters of nonviolent communication seemed to be some of the most violent communicators I'd ever met. So it seemed like, oh, this is just another community of people who have ideas but don't actually use them. <laughs> Finally, I gave in and I read about it. And to hear some of the stories involved in to, some of the stories that Marshall Rosenberg told that some of his direct uh, students told about the, the, the power of just of merely bringing uh, different groups of people together in the same physical space and giving them an opportunity to talk to each other and even letting them yell at each other a bit and even yelling, letting them yell horrible things at each other, mm -hmm. that that can be the beginning of a stronger relationship. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, we all know that's true. It's risky. It invites failure. But when it works, it works really well. Um, it's one of the reasons why I will allow myself to use the techniques like I need you to speak Estonian by Thursday um, because it's better than just walking away. I shouldn't say it's better. It, it, it has a higher likelihood of breaking through than just walking away. And so if we want in that situation to break through, uh, then we can't just walk away. If in that situation we want these groups of people to be able to have a better influence on each other and to work together better, simply, I mean, you could imagine engineering that accident of scheduling a meeting so that it starts 10 minutes before the last meeting ends as a way of getting people who normally don't talk to each other to bump into each other. Um, I've never used that trick, but it's something that it would be interesting to try to do. Um, as a way of helping people who believe that they have nothing to learn from each other, that they're too different from each other, helping them see that they're struggling with similar problems. I, I having seen those problems in non-programmer centered groups of people, try to bring those, try to bring that information to programming centered groups of people because clients tend to pay me to work with programming centered groups of people. So I feel a little bit like I'm the postman, right? Part of my job is to bring news from the non-programming part of the organization to the programmers. Um, but you know, there's, there's a perfect analog of me in a, in a company somewhere doing exactly the opposite, bringing the news from the programmer group into some non-programmer part of the organization, whether it's marketing or sales or uh, business analysis or finance, whatever, to show them that we are just, we are struggling with the same kinds of problems. And if we're struggling with the same kinds of problems, then maybe some of the things that we've learned about how to deal with those problems can help them. And some of the things that they've learned can help us.
So I want to go back to the alignment is autonomy thing for a moment. There's a couple of um, so a lot of talked about so far. I think there's some little bits and pieces that can help. Um, one of the things that really comes to my mind, um, I guess two, and I wrote them down this time, so I'm not going to forget. Uh, one of them is a simple, stupid trick of actually um, having a model for how to think about delegating decision making. So, question of alignment versus autonomy. I imagine that we're 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 ultimately dealing with a situation where um, someone in a position of authority wants to enable more autonomy within other groups, but is worried that those groups will not align enough with each other and they wants to hold back. Now, it can be the same if it's groups struggling with each other or if there's one person on top who is worried, who is observing the group struggling with each other and is worried about what's happening. Uh, to me, I don't think it really matters. The only difference is whether our view includes this person or not. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things that comes to my mind is um, helping people feel comfortable with the idea that this is not a problem to solve. And what I mean specifically by that is that alignment and autonomy are both important. They stand in fundamental conflict with each other and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, I liken it to when I, so I hear programmers a lot c complain that, you know, uh, those stupid customers, uh, keep asking us to do too much stuff. They keep asking us for too many features. They never give us time to care about the design. They never give us time to, uh, to, to, uh, to test our stuff. And if we try to spend some of their energy understanding more deeply what it is they're asking, they resist us. And often they will ask me, well, well, like, how do we fix the customer? How do we solve this problem? And one of the things that I try to tell them is that this is not a problem to be solved. And that, that, that's a counterintuitive thing that makes them nervous, that makes them kind of, some of them immediately stop listening to me, but some of them sit up and like, okay, well, maybe he's not full of shit. What could he possibly mean by this? Mm -hmm. It's part of the natural order of things. And even a good sign. The part one of the customer's jobs is to ask you for more than you can possibly deliver. Because if they didn't, that means the business is failing and you're going to lose your job soon. Mm -hmm. This is part of what it means to deliver features in a business context compared to working on your open source hobby project on the weekends. <laughs> Um, this is the difference between being a hobbyist and being a professional right. that, uh, and when, by the way, when I say professional, I want to be very clear. I only mean, do you get paid? That's the only definition of professional that matters. I'm not using that as code for being good or responsible. I mean, just, I'm talking about the difference between writing software on the weekend because you're interested and writing software for money because you need to feed your family. Mm -hmm. When you are writing software for money, it's probably good that you who are delivering the features are the bottleneck. Mm -hmm. Because if you aren't the bottleneck, that means that there's not enough demand. And if there's not enough, if there's low demand for a long enough period of time, some of you programmers will be gone because then there's no reason to keep you. So don't look at this as a problem to be solved. Look at this instead as a balance to be reached, that there's going to be natural there's going to be, there's a natural conflict in here and that the presence of the conflict is a good thing. That's really the key part of the message that I want to convey. Mm -hmm. That the existence of the conflict is a sign of good things happening. Mm -hmm. That if that conflict disappears, we should be it's, it's a little bit like if you have children playing in the other room and they stop making noise for 10 minutes, you should be worried. Exactly. Right? Yes. And I think that this I think that alignment and autonomy share a similar relationship with each other as concepts. Mm -hmm. It's extremely important to ensure that the people who have responsibility for a result have autonomy uh, have strong autonomy about how to achieve that result. That's a pretty obvious thing. I think that's mostly a settled question by now and it's more a question of just uh, it's more a matter of, of of helping people feel comfortable with that. 
And one of the ways to help them feel comfortable with that is to teach them a model for how to delegate decision making. Mm -hmm. Joe, we have five minutes left. Yeah. So I, I, so the good news is I write any of this so I can just point you to things and you can yeah. read about them later. Mm -hmm. um, so once people are comfortable with the idea that this conflict between alignment and autonomy is natural and a good thing, mm -hmm. it means we're trying to improve. Then one of the things to help people feel more comfortable is to encourage them to learn more about delegating that maybe they've not learned about how to delegate decision making safely. Right? Maybe they've read a book like Sources of Power by Gary Klein and they have some understanding mm -hmm. that it's a good idea to move decision making closer to the people who have the information with which to make the decision. They might even understand the importance of aligning of, sorry, I don't want to use alignment because it's, it's a com wording conflict, of putting together autonomy and responsibility. But they might not know how to do it because there, I, as far as I know, there isn't an undergraduate course in effective delegating mm. in, you know, university. If there is, mm. I've not seen it yet. Maybe, there's, maybe there is a class in that in an MBA program, but I haven't gone, gone through it. So something like the delegation model from Management 3.0 could be helpful mm -hmm. because it is a beginner's way to think about how to delegate that there are essentially seven levels of delegation that range all the way from I trust you do what you think is right come to me when you need help on the one hand and on the other hand here is a very narrow area a sandbox for you to play in and I'm going to watch you closely and I think that when we adopt a model like this I think there are two benefits. One benefit is that for people who do not have an intuitive understanding of how to delegate effectively, this model gives them a place to start learning that thing. Mm -hmm. It gives them a place to start delegating decision-making safely. Uh, it also gives, by the way, the, the, it gives the, uh, I'll call them the receiving group, um, it gives them the feeling more like there is a way for them to negotiate for more authority and more autonomy as opposed to it being a power play. Mm -hmm. Knowing that there is a model that they can appeal to makes it easier for us to see this as a skill we can develop instead of a fight that we're having. Mm -hmm. And the other part of it is that um, uh, having a model, so there's the, there's the fact that we can learn how to delegate effectively uh, oh, right. Uh, and recognizing that there is value in only discussing how we're going to negotiate this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That not just understanding how to negotiate it is helpful, but discussing openly how we're going to negotiate it. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially having rules of engagement or ground rules, as it were, for how we're going to negotiate this balance between alignment and authority mm -hmm. or autonomy. Um, it, it tends to make it easier for us, more effective, I would say, not easier. It tends to make it more effective for us to struggle with the problem together if we recognize that we are openly struggling with the problem together, as opposed to doing it in the shadows, seizing power, seizing power back. Um, I remember having a, a, you know, a, a discussion with a group of programmers that started with why are, we, why are our pull requests being stuck? And within 20 minutes got to the discussion of, well, how do you negotiate the way you treat each other as people? And everyone looking at each other like they didn't understand the question. And that was the first time that we had together talked about the very idea that you can openly negotiate or talk about how you negotiate, how you treat each other. And, in much, and once we had that discussion, then they were more open and transparent and direct in telling each other when they, when they felt threatened, telling each other when they felt like someone was overstepping boundaries, being able to resolve conflict, uh, that that helped them convert towards a good balance between, you know, getting pull requests done, but treating each other with respect or alignment and autonomy or, you know, me making the decisions and you making the decisions that if we are openly aware of the fact that we are negotiating this balance, then we are more likely to negotiate that balance more effectively 
than we would be if we let it be unspoken. Yeah, right. So I think those two things together help a lot. That that recognize helping people recognize that the you know it's not the goal to value alignment or to value autonomy. It's and it's not a problem that those two are in conflict, that it's actually a good sign that those two are in conflict. Because if we had autonomy without alignment, right, that's what? Authoritarian, that's uh, anarchy. Yes. And if we had alignment without autonomy, that's authoritarianism. Exactly. We don't want either of those things. Uh, we have to have those two things together. And maybe not everyone is comfortable with the fact that those two things, that that conflict is a, is a healthy sign instead of a sign of disease. And then once they have that, it's easier to say, Let's use a technique like the management 3.0 delegation board seven step model thing as a way of both becoming more comfortable understanding how to delegate, how to, I don't say delegate now, I want to say how to share decision making, mm -hmm. um, which is another way of saying how to balance alignment and autonomy, mm -hmm. um, as well as being open about the fact that we are using this model as a way of negotiating alignment of an autonomy so that we're all aware mm -hmm. of the need to balance these things and that uh, in the process, that openness tends to make us more effective at then doing it. I, d I trust your motivation more and you trust my motivation more when I say something because we understand it in the context of trying to figure out how to share decision-making. Yep, well, that's great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thank you, very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I right. try to make like an Oscars. So when you're over time, I'm, I put the music on. Yes, don't <laughs> worry. I'm done. <laughs> it was awesome. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Very Great good. conversation. I prepared 15 questions for you, which I don't want to put over. I said, if I put this here now, this will be so awkward. Er, blah. <laughs> no. <laughs> It was that's a good a session. That's a, different, that's a different kind of session that I like to do. That's a way that I can demonstrate how to do agile planning. Because if we have 22 questions and only one hour, then I can do the arithmetic. I start by giving 90 second answers to every question, and then we figure out what to do with the remaining time. <laughs> yeah, but he, uh, let's say the group of conversations. So we had the peak at 16 people. Hmm. So it was 60 people. Uh, 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 register, which is okay, <coughs> and, and that's a group is a group of major people or people asking good question. Even if the maid was a little bit rude, to be honest, all my colleagues in Germany all like this men or women, like <laughs> at the beginning, you say, oh, What is happening here? and but that's okay, right? Part of the reason I meditate is so that I have I am more aware of my reaction in that moment. <laughs> Uh, but the I thing, practice. Uh, uh, it works well. Sometimes I yell with this guy, and so and so uh, I, in, in, the, in the group, like like you and Pierre, you didn't get this in the meeting. Very rude to say, and then me, eighty people on on a Skype head said, "Oh fuck up, you asshole!" I just break it down. I have everybody look at you like me. Says, "What's happening now?" Mm -hmm. You you know what is most terrible. The next day, same call, and then the guy say, oh, Pierre was right. Then I get out. It's not possible. <laughs> but, okay, but that's life, right? Absolutely. Right. That's life. Okay, thank you so much, guys. So next session in two weeks about Mirror Mirror is a tool, again, happy for coaching. And so that's a conversation, right? I, I, I love having you here for the first time seeing face-to-face. So, okay. Joe, great, my pleasure. Guys, have you, thank you for your time. Enjoy your evening. And what we can say, happy almost Wednesday. Yep. Yes. <laughs> have a good evening, yes. everyone. Have and I will show you. Bye-bye. Good bye -bye. evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.